I'm like like you said, I'm usually speaking about the Amazon. So this is exciting for me for the first time in 10 years to actually be speaking about something that I've never shared before. This is the other side of my work which takes place in India. And I think that most of us have I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up with this this idea in my head of India like from the Jungle Book, like you know, we all have that, that image of the Indian forest, a girl with carrying water on her head, of tigers, of elephants. Um, my problem with the Jungle Book was I could never understand why he made the tiger the bad guy. That was always a problem for me, but we will address that later on. Um, this forest, to me, this jungle has some of the most incredible creatures on the planet. This is where you find peacocks. And in the morning, they're calling from the trees. And you see them, they're constantly displaying India is known for its snakes and its culture of snake charmers, and you very rarely see snake charmers anymore, but that, it's still there. This is actually a current photo by a, this is a guy named Vava Suresh, and he does snake rescues. And as snakes go into like towns and villages, he'll come in and he'll try and rescue them and take them out. But to get that many all trained on you at the same time and not mess up is actually pretty hard to do, I can tell you from experience. Um, the peacock-tailed bear is an incredible species that you find in India. <laughs> I do that just to make sure everybody's paying attention. But it's a cool picture. Um, these don't look real, but they are. This is a gawar or guar, depending on tomato, tomato. Um, but it's the largest living bovine species. They stand seven feet at the shoulder. And they have just, they're just draped in these, in these piles of muscle. It's honestly, it's one of the most terrifying animals I've ever seen, but they're beautiful. Just these big, drooling, hulking things that are, you know, the size of a minivan. And the most, probably the most terrifying thing about them, though, is that a single tiger can take them down, which makes you say, how powerful is a tiger? And there was one time that we were walking through a national park, and one of those bison had been killed by a tiger and you could see the skull on the ground and the skull was so much bigger than I was. It just looked like something that was, it was unrealistically big. And the guy's going, this is a tiger kill and we're looking at the tiger tracks all around it. And the scariest thing about it was you just said, how, how big and how powerful is a tiger if it took this thing down? And that is really how I want to start this tonight, that I think that we know what a tiger looks like, but I don't think that most of us truly understand what a tiger really is. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Um, first, first off, just physically. When I, when I was thinking of a tiger, like as a kid growing up, I never, I never imagined them to be that much different than a dog. I just thought of sort of like a, maybe a, a pretty large dog. This is probably what I had in my mind. Um, something of a manageable size, but this is like a six month old cub. Now this was in a zoological park in Myrtle Beach, and this was under you know, I was, I was there to study tiger behavior for the book, and they brought this guy out, and they're going around, and, and the trainer was like, yeah, but you, you want something bigger. You want to see, like, a full-grown tiger. And I was like, I guess. I don't know. Sure. And he brought out this, um, and, and it, was, it was terrifying. And my, my friend who was taking the photos, he came up to me at one point where we had a break, and he was just like, you've got to stop looking so scared. And I was like, but I am that scared. It's so scary. I mean, the amount of muscle, if you look at the size of his neck to the size of my neck, when you're there right next to him, it's, they're, they're, they're just on a whole other level from us. They're so much more athletic and quick, and you realize how intelligent they are when you see them sort of. He, was, he, he enjoyed scaring me. You could just see him. He kept turning his head towards me and growling, and he'd be like, uh, he enjoyed that. Um, their tongues are even armored. Like we, if for anybody that has cats, you know how rough your cat's tongue is. But on a tiger, it's like shark's teeth. They can lick the skin off of their prey. They're incredibly powerful with just their tongues. Um, the cub that I was playing with, at the next day I had most of the skin on my arms. Was like, it's like I had fallen on concrete or something. I just had all these sort of abrasion, abrasions all over my skin. Um, now the, the, but the thing that I think could, could most accurately, to me, describe the power of a tiger is a story um, so when you, when you go back to about, the, I think it was the 1790s when Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright was written. And at that time, there's probably about 150,000 tigers in the world, maybe 200,000. We don't really have data for that time. That's kind of prehistory for wildlife conservation because nobody had a 
concept that anything was going to start being depleted. But if you move up to like the turn of the century, 1900, 1905, the story happened in Nepal and the north of India that I think to me just made me really realize how incredibly powerful and smart these animals are. It was in the Nepalese village where this one tigress started picking off people. Now, tigers usually don't do that. They're almost, you know, they almost, ne they can't stand humans, actually. They stay away from them. And tiger attacks on people are very rare unless the tiger's so old that his teeth are going and he's weak and he can't take a deer. So this young tigress started hunting people. And today we know that a tiger eats about roughly a deer a week. And those, you know, for every, for every I think, for every about 20 attempts on a deer, they, they get one. So they're constantly trying to hunt, and the deer are just a little bit faster than them, so the tiger's got to outsmart them. But people in the fields are just bent over doing farm work. For a tiger, it's easy. You just walk out of the forest. It's like picking up an apple out of the grocery store, and you walk back into the forest. And you figure a deer a week and a, a villager a week is about the same thing. So after two years, we had a couple of, I think it was 200 people in this village had been carried away. And of course, they tried to get the tiger. They tried to put out meat to poison the tiger. They tried to have marksmen come in and shoot the tiger. Nothing worked. So what they did was they got a huge team of people together, and they surrounded the forest, and they burnt it down, and they figured they'd just incinerate everything. And that would be better than having a man-eating tiger patrolling around these villages. The tiger was smart. Saw all the people coming into the forest and just crossed over the border and went into India. So they burned down their forest, and they thought the tiger was gone. The people in India had no idea what was coming. So she got hungry, and in the first year, another 100 people were gone. And now they called in British snipers. They called in expert trackers. They, ca they, they called in the cavalry. And another year passed of them attempting to get this tiger, and nobody could bring her down. The only time that somebody even got eyes on her that didn't die was somebody that had believed himself to be a good marksman, and he got the tiger in his sights, and he put the gun up. And then he actually threw the gun on the ground and ran for it because he, this man was smart enough and experienced enough of a hunter to know that if you shoot a bear, it'll get scared and it'll run away. If you shoot a tiger, it'll charge you and rip you apart. So he saw that in the tiger's eyes and just threw his gun and figured he'd rather live. Um, so what they did was they got a team of elephants and they got 300 people together and they brought in the most famous problem tiger hunter, this guy named Jim Corbett, and they sent all these people out into the forest into a big hoop and they basically made a choke point to a valley and they had him waiting there with a high-powered rifle and with the elephants and all the people and they had drums and they had fire and they went through the whole forest and finally they forced her out and he fired off a few rounds and he brought her down. Now at this point her body count was over 400. And as soon as he shot her, the thing is, Jim Corbett later became a very, very passionate conservationist. He started as a tiger hunter, and then as he saw how much habitat we were losing in India and how quickly tiger population was de declining, uh, the later part of his life, he was a very passionate conservationist. But this tiger, when he pulled back her jowls and looked at her teeth, they realized she'd been shot when she was young. She'd never even properly had her adult canines, and so she wasn't able to hunt natural prey. So she had to go for easy people, so which means that we really created the problem in the first place because somebody shot her. But the, the, the ability of this one tiger to outsmart that many people, to remain that hidden, and to keep it going for that long. I mean, these, these, these guys were expert, expert trackers and hunters um, that would, you know, sort of put all of us to shame, I think, in modern times. They were living it every day. But what happened, though, is that at this time, as India was modernizing, you also had shikari tiger hunts where you had people coming from all over the world to go on Maharaja rides and shoot tigers. And from an elephant back, a tiger doesn't really register. If you're on the ground in the forest, you'll almost never see a tiger because they won't allow a human to see them. If you're on the back of an elephant, the tiger really just sees the elephant and it, it just sort of doesn't uh, compute for them. So being on the back of an elephant with a high-powered rifle, you can just move your finger a little bit and shoot a tiger. and feel tough. Um, this guy put machine guns on the back of his Rolls Royce and he had his tiger murdering machine. And so from 1900 to the year 2000, uh, this is what tiger, like what tiger range on planet Earth used to look like, all of that blocked in area. And then this is today, this is what tiger range is left. You see the orange, what it looked like and what it is now. So this, and, and the other thing is that this isn't where there are tigers. This is where there could be tigers. 
So we went from 100,000 tigers to 3,000 tigers. And now in the last few decades, we've been struggling with the fact that tigers are on the brink of extinction. And we've also already lost a few of the subspecies. So originally we had Sumatran tigers, which are very small and live in the jungle. We had the Siberian tiger, which is gigantic and grows to be 13 feet and weigh like 800 pounds. They're the monsters. We had the Caspian tiger that until I think about 1997 was actually found in Turkey. And in our lifetimes, that was just, that was taken out. The last Caspian tiger was killed in about 1997. Um, but we've lost several of these unique tiger subspecies and Bengal tigers and the tigers that live in, I mean, tigers right now, that 3,000 is spread out across India, Nepal, Bhutan, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Indonesia. I mean, there's, there's a big geographical range and there's just a few of these tigers out there. And the tigers that are out there don't have much forest left because there's really people everywhere. And so this is a picture of a tiger that had come into an Indian village. And this is a picture of a tiger named Kala. And this picture, this picture was a very important thing for me to see because my friends posted this story out of India and Kala fell into a well because she was pushed out of her territory by her mother. Because once they, once they become mature, the mother pushes their children away. They'll, they'll fight them savagely and push them away because my territory is my territory, not yours. And she was, she was trying to migrate from one forest to the next forest. And I think she was trying to get water, but she fell into a well in India. And when the villagers found it, instead of killing her, they actually called the Indian Forest Department. They lowered ropes and nets and they tranquilized her. And, you can see on her forehead she'd rubbed a little bit off because she was just panicked and frightened and stressed. And the, the look in her eyes, though, is just so savagely wild that it, I just, it, just, it just grabbed me. But what she did for us, though, was that she showed us what the life of a modern-day tiger is actually like. Because after they spent about two months letting her recuperate, they kept her in captivity, they fitted her with a radio collar. And when they released her, we started getting to see how a modern tiger moves. And so you think of India with 1.3 billion people, and this tiger is moving through farms and villages and it, during the nighttime. And then in the daytime, she'd bed down underneath a bush or like on the edge of a field. And they would see farmers working in their fields, and that these people would have no idea that there was a tiger right over there. And she would just be quietly laying in the shade, waiting for nighttime. And then when nighttime would come, she'd be out, and she would poach goats or dogs or something she became the face of modern tiger conservation because without the radio collar and what we learned from Kala, we never would have known the extent to which they travel. And she covered hundreds of miles, constantly, constantly walking all night long and um, managing to remain unseen by millions and millions of people as she did it. It's an incredible story. And this is, a, this is another photo of another tigress and she's got cubs with her. Um, it's just, it's one of the most incredible stories I've ever heard of. The fact that these, you know, giant, giant animals can be migrating through India with all those people and just, they're like, they're like ghosts. Um, now, as we've been, as I've been in South India moving around, I mean, I went there because of this idea of tigers, but you cannot enter a forest in Asia without thinking and being affected by the elephants. And to me, elephants, if you think back to just prehistoric time, go back 5,000 years, there was something like 22 species of different types of proboscids of elephants. They had all different variations on where their trunks and tusks came from and what, where they lived. They were all over Europe and we have woolly mammoths, mastodons, elephants. They are so influential in engineering their forests, in our forests, the forest that we grew up in as a species, they're carrying seeds, hundreds and hundreds of different types of seeds from everything that they're eating all day long. They're constantly breaking down branches and managing the forest. I mean, one thing that I, when I was growing up, I never thought of, and then as I became, um, as I became experienced in the field, you see that forests are not just the place where animals live. Forests are the product of what animals do. Birds and bees and bats are pollinating things. The large animals like the elephants are carrying seeds back and forth and moving things. We wouldn't have forests if it wasn't for the animals that make them. And the, there's nothing that's been more influential for us than elephants. And as all of that forest gets cut back and as tiger habitat gets cut back, of course, 
so does the elephant forest, but elephants are known for their migrations. They migrate all over the landscape. And in India, you have roads going through so much elephant habitat that examples like this, this was a road that was put through one of their, one of their migration routes and it's like for the babies, how do they get over that? You have compound walls, you have schools, villages, it just, it just doesn't work. And then you have, you know, you can see the crowd forming over there. It never goes well for the elephants. And then I'd say that one of the few examples of where elephants and people do get along is that this boy was someone we met on the edge of a tribal village. And he, he told us that his parents were gone. He was an orphan. But this is his elephant. And he rode in on this elephant while we were there. We were by the riverside and he rode in and he was smoking a cigarette and he was like on top of his elephant and he like, you know, he patted her on the head and she held up her leg and he climbed down and he just, you know, he said the command and she rolled over into the water and then he, he spent like a half hour scrubbing down his elephant and talking to her and everything else. And then we talked to him for a little bit and he said, yeah, this is my elephant. We're going to go move some, limb, some lumber today. You know, we're going to do this and that. And then he like, you know, the elephant stood up, he climbed back on top of her and he rode off. But this little barefoot kid smoking cigarettes riding around on an elephant um, was just incredible. Um, the relationship between them and how the elephant completely knew what this kid was thinking uh, was unbelievable. And actually another elephant there had been blind, intentionally blinded by other elephants. They'd gotten into a fight and the other elephants had poked out his eyes. Um, and he had a mahout. And the amazing thing was that this kid, the other kid was riding around on the blind elephant telling him where to go. And they said if he was in the wild, he would have died a long time ago. But the, the Lost Boys of India Club um, takes care of these elephants on the fringe of the tribal areas. And it's such a rare thing because, you know, in our countries we have circuses that are abusive towards elephants. And, you know, you have so many, it's very rare to see um, such an intimate relationship between humans and a wild animal that this photo uh, was very influential in the, in, the, in, in the book that we're here for tonight. Um, this is actually one of the, this is one of the characters in the book named Ramachandran and this elephant is named Ramachandran. This is, this is, this is one I didn't have to work on much. He's 11 feet tall. He's killed, I, I think, I forget if it's four or five cows. He's killed multiple trainers. He's run through other elephants and killed them. He's this big, angry tusker. We call them tuskers, the male elephants with the big tusks. Um, he's so violent, but he's so big that no one wants to, they're not going to euthanize him. They're not going to let him go. They want to show him off. And so they keep him chained in the back of this temple ground, which is a horrible story. But the power of Ramachandran is legendary. And people have been trying to get him freed for, for decades. I think he's something like 70 years old now. Um, but he's, he's one of the big ones. And I would say, just like the tiger, when, you, when I thought of an elephant, I always thought of elephants as very, I don't know, soft and more like a stuffed animal, just more friendly. I always thought of elephants as very sweet. And I thought, well, because they're herbivores, they must be, they must be very non-aggressive. But the thing is, you saw that picture of the elephants crossing the road. And the other side of the story is that as these huge animals are, are taken out of their forests, well, you have elephants that are like stuck eating garbage piles. You have elephants that have nothing to eat, so they go to farms and they raid bananas. And of course, the farmers and the people across India have to react to that. I've seen, I actually know a farmer who lost $20,000 worth of banana crops in a single night to a single elephant. Because he wasn't just eating the bananas, he was also just walking around and crushing everything. So this, this war has started between humans and elephants. And the thing is, as the elephants have fire thrown at them, as they get electrocuted, they get poisoned, all these things, they begin to just associate humans as pain. And an elephant is smart enough that then they start saying, well, if I see one, I'm going to kill it. Because elephants know how to do that. And the story to me that illustrated how powerful elephants are is that I was walking on the side of a stream. And I had my notebook, I had my little moleskin notebook, and I was, I, there was, I was on one side of a stream, and over there on the other side was a female and her sisters, and there was a few elephants over there, and I had this very romantic view in my head that I was going to find a tree branch, and I was going to sit there with my notebook and, like, sketch them and write things down, and I thought I was being very, very calm, and, and I thought I was safe. And as I'm walking through the forest, I kept looking towards the elephants and keeping an eye on them, because as big as elephants are, they can vanish so quickly. 
so, so quickly and soundlessly. So I'm trying to keep my eyes on them because if you look away and then they're gone, they're just gone. And as I'm walking down this side of this, of this stream, I just come face to face with the hind side of a bull elephant. And when you think about how many times this thing must have had fire thrown at him and, and fireworks thrown at him and rocks, he saw a person that close to him and he turns around and he just looks at me like, what? And he turned around and he slapped a tree in half. He trumpeted so loud that I almost was taken off my feet by just how loud it was in my ears. And then he started running after me. And they say you're supposed to like stay there when an elephant charges. No, 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 no. I didn't do that at all. Um, I ran and I threw my backpack off and I'm weaving behind between trees. And I'm, I, if I could show you what I saw when this was happening, I looked behind me and there were literally trees just going down. And I, as I'm getting stuck in thorn bushes and like, you know, it would, it would, it stops you. You get stuck in the thorn bush and it tears your clothes. It holds you down. He was just breaking through trees and thorn bushes do nothing to his skin. So I was, it, it was this close. I'd say it's the closest I ever came to dying. He wanted to crush me so badly. And when I got to the edge of that stream, it went down for about 12 feet, and I just hurled myself off of it and rolled down the thing and landed in the water. And as the elephant got to the edge, he did like one of these where he kind of like, he almost came down too, which would have killed both of us because he would have landed on his head and his neck would have broken and he would have landed on me, so I would have just been mush. I was down there screaming, and he was up there and he threw a stick at me, and I think I gave him the finger. I mean, we were just, <laughs> we were just so angry at each other. And he like screamed off into the forest and I went to go get my backpack. But I was, I was bleeding rather heavily from that because at some point during the run, I smacked my head into a tree. Um, but the power of that elephant will never, I will never forget it. And I will always wish that I could somehow share that with people because that animal was, had so much rage in him for humans. He just looked at me and just said, I am going to turn you into slop. And, and he should. But there are those places where, where humans have a beautiful relationship with elephants. And these guys actually, they're part of the Kuruba tribe. And these boys were working on the ground on the day I took this photo. And up in the canopy were other tribal kids that are walking around barefoot in the canopy with machetes in their mouths, cutting the best, this was some ficus fruit, I'm not sure what the name of it was. But they were cutting fruits, throwing them down, and the elephant would just lift up the branches, put it on his back. These guys would just lash them down. They spent the whole day like this, but it, it really, it brought me back where I said, oh my, you know, what am I looking at? Because it looked like something that was straight out of Jungle Book, that, these, that this is still happening. Like, you know, we have, we have all the technology we have, and we're flying around in planes, and we have iPhones, and the people are going to the moon, and these guys are still there riding elephants through the jungle. Um, and, and this is such a, such a vanishing world that finding these last places where these people are undisturbed in their forest doing this is becoming harder and harder. This is a, <laughs> it's just, there's so much of passing up and down because up on top of the elephant, you're so high up that they're always passing. This is just uh, them getting water. And then of course there's, you know, these people spend this intense, like a lifetime with an elephant. You have an elephant that's 70 years old that they've worked with for decades and decades. This was, this actually isn't my photo, but this is, I thought a very beautiful photo of an elephant uh, in her last hours as the, the community goes around her. Um, Indian tribal people is, is, is a crazy and very tragic story because you have these pictures, you have these places where people are still living this very close to the land where the lives of the people, the lives of the animals and the forest, it's all braided together. But then conservationists are also coming in and saying, well, we need to make a tiger reserve because there's not enough forest. So then what they do is they push the tribal people out. And what you have here on the top is two pictures I took of tribal people living in the forest. And on the bottom, you have two pictures of tribal people that are in resettled, government-issued resettlement houses. And they're just like a concrete box. And the people that lived in the forest collecting honey and collecting medicines from the trees and hunting small birds are suddenly put outside on a windy hilltop with no shade, no water, and they're told to go get a job. And they don't deal with it very well. And seeing that um, is, was pretty hard to watch. Now, usually, <laughs> wherever I go, I'm usually always looking out for snakes. I'm very, I've always, I've always loved snakes. I've been close to snakes my whole life. And all over the world, people, you know, for even in this country, I just, just a few weeks ago, I was out on a hike, 
and I heard someone scream, water moccasin, which I instantly, as a trigger for me, I went running because there's no water moccasins here. We have northern water snakes that are harmless and they eat fish. Um, so I went and this guy was very excited and he was already like getting his stick so he could like, you know, do something that he thought was heroic for a harmless snake that was this big. Um, but I'm constantly having to save snakes from stupid humans. And uh, this, though, was probably one of the best things that ever happened. We got a call while we were in India, and I was hanging out with the snake catchers. And this is the thing with India, is that there's so much happening with development and corporations and the government and so much forest destruction, but there's so many people in India that are really fighting for wildlife. This is a king cobra. And what we, what we found was that he was on the edge of this village, and nobody could figure out why he'd come in from the forest. And a local snake catcher grabbed him, and he said, he was going, the reason he comes, he goes, he just wants water. He goes, all the streams are dried up. And we said, this 11-foot venomous king cobra that could kill you in minutes, we gave him water. And he drank. And I got a video because, and I don't think that most people have ever seen a snake drinking. You can see in a second, my friend, who's a National Geographic photographer, uh, his name is Trevor, he's taking some pictures and you see how tall this snake is. It's such an impressive snake. And he's standing there just saying, stand back, because if you make me, I'll kill you. But he was, he was giving us the chance. And then the, the snake rescuer himself was just pouring the water. And you can actually see him just taking. He drank for like 10 straight minutes. This poor snake was so thirsty. And as soon as we gave him some, some water, we just we kind of ushered him off towards forest. And he went right back in. But the villagers were terrified. And they thought that this snake had come to kill their babies. And it's like, he just he needed water. Um, so that was a good teaching experience for the people of that region. Um, now I'm going to leave India for just a few minutes, so bear with me. And there's a reason for it. Um, usually my work over the last 13 years take, takes place in the Amazon. I left high school after sophomore year because I couldn't take it and I wasn't good at it and I wanted to go to the jungle. I grew up, my parents made the mistake of taking me to the Bronx Zoo and that put the idea in my head when I was very, very young that all the big, beautiful, amazing, adventurous, cool places out there were going to be gone by the time I was old enough to see them. Because you go to the Bronx Zoo and they show you all this beautiful wildlife and then they have the part of the exhibit where you hear, they have the sound of chainsaws and trees going down and they tell you that the entire world is dying. So I grew up horrified by that and I wanted to get out there and see this stuff. So. At 18, I went to the Amazon, and for the last 13 years, I've been working with the indigenous people down there. And I run an ecotourism company that basically gives people jobs, people that were loggers and gold miners and uh, that did all sorts of other extractive things. We give them jobs as cooks and boat drivers and guides, and they like it a lot better, and they eat better, and they get paid better, and they get to hang out with people from all over the world. And so many of them have come up to me and just been like, this is so much better than logging was. And I'm like, yeah, man, like it's great. And then, so we turned them into protecting their own forests because most people don't want to destroy things. They, they're, they're just, they previously thought that that was the only way that they could make a living. Today we're protecting 30,000 acres of pristine Amazon. And I, I'm assuming that everybody that's here tonight is pretty environmentally aware. And so you guys have all heard about the Amazon fires and everything that's been going on with that. And I've spent the greater part of the last few weeks trying to tell people that a the Amazon's not supposed to be burning because there was a lot of people coming out and saying well fires are a natural part of an ecosystem this isn't California um, that you can't put out 70,000 intentionally set fires that slash and burn agriculture is being done by the people there and that the only way to make sure that the Amazon doesn't burn past the point where it can't be recovered is to make sure that the ancient complex jungle is producing the rain clouds that are going to keep the Amazon system going because it's the Amazon produces all the moisture that rains down on it and so that's what we do I have an organization called jungle keepers and what we do is just try to keep it not so that we don't have to repair it later we try to just get it so that pr protect it before it's broken now when we bring people there we have like a research station and we have guides cooks everything and we bring university students. I've had groups of special forces who have come and they said take us on like a crazy jungle expedition. Uh, but the, the, the thing in the last few years that really stuck with me was that we had a family come and they had these two daughters and the younger daughter, um, her name was Isha, and little 11 year old kid but she was so in touch with wildlife. 
And it was to the degree that when I would kill a mosquito, she'd point her hand at me and be like, what did you just do? Well, I killed a mosquito. She goes, but you're the guy that's supposed to protect animals. I said, yeah, but it was a mosquito and it was sucking my blood. And, and she would defend that. And she'd go, well, you either love animals or you don't love animals. So how can you get mad at somebody for shooting an elephant if you're killing mosquitoes? And it was just, she'd have these intense philosophical discussions with you, defending the life of every, she would take the time out of her 11-year-old life to defend every little life form. And even in our kitchen, we have um, like a screened-in kitchen, but with open doors. So all these butterflies go in there during the day. And the, the windows are covered in dead butterflies. And no one thinks about it ever. And she was in there every day with a jar rescuing the butterflies. And so sooner or later, I was in there with a jar rescu rescuing the butterflies because that was just the effect that she had because she was so passionate about it. And on the last day of the trip, when we were leaving, we saw these two poachers and they had these ancient giant tortoises with them. And they were, they, what they do is they shove a piece of bamboo in the front of the shell and then they wrap it really tight so that the, the tortoise can't keep its head, can't remove its head, and they can carry it kind of like a suitcase. And so these guys are coming in from the forest as we were trying to get out. And little Isha sees us and she goes, you know, just right away her eyes fill with tears and she looks at me and she just goes, what are you going to do? And I was like, you know, well, we're going to go back to we're going to go back to town and i said you know you can't buy endangered species off of poachers because then what they're going to do is do it more you know and I was, that's that's what they tell you as a conservationist and i think that i'd gotten pretty callous by that point and she just was like this is complete she looks, looked at me like you're just you just disgust me you know how could you let these tortoises die this is happening right now and of course just fast forward a half hour and i had a very strange negotiation in spanish with these men uh, and I bought tortoises from them, and they could not understand why, because they knew that I wasn't going to eat them. And they were like, "Why do you want these these tortoises, Gringo?" And like, anyway, we took the tortoises and we released them. But uh, her sensitivity for animals was was remarkable to say the least. And then a few years later, I uh, I, we, I kept in touch with her, and she'd sometimes send me send me messages from school because she where she goes to school in India. They were from India. And so she went back to India after that Amazon trip, and I would get messages like, oh, we saw a leopard on campus today. I rescued, you know, a small butterfly. But then I was just about to leave. I was in the Amazon, and it was, I think it was 2014 or 2015. And I woke up at 4 in the morning, and I had an email, and it was from Isha. And it said, I have a question about a tigress. And I opened the email, and it was like, you're the person that protects animals, so you're the only one that can answer this question. This tiger has, this tigress has gone missing, and her cubs are in the village, and I know where they are, and I'm going to protect them. And because you're the animal guy, I need you to know, I need to know, like, what do you feed a baby tiger, and where should I bring it? And it was like all these very, very rational questions about going to rescue a tiger. <laughs> and that actually, for me, was the beginning of what sparked all of this. And that's what I've been trying to take you guys through is all of the real life stories that became this book. The Boy and His Elephant, the Tiger Kala, the Snake Charmers, Isha and the Tiger, the giant elephants that have nowhere else to go. These are all characters that led to the formation of this book because as I, like for my first book, which was nonfiction, I very much just told the story of me going to the Amazon. But for this, the story, the, the question for me was how to bring people into the world of a modern day tiger without making it very, very dry. You know, tigers migrate at 400 kilometers per week. And you know, no, 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 I wanted, I, wanted I wanted to go inside the mind of Kala. I wanted to go inside of like her crazy, savage, wild eyes and understand what she's going through. And after the amount of time that I've spent on, in the field in India, I've seen so much of this story that I didn't know how to tell any other way. And, and uh, that's how it came. When I got that email, I just said, my God, that's, that's how to do it. This was towards the end of the time. This was actually just last year at this time when I was finishing the book, going through the last phases. And I just, I want to share this with you because it, it gives you an example of how, uh, well, I guess how, how intimately I worked with the wildlife to bring you this story. Cause I, I do think it's the story that they'd want me to tell, but this was my, this was my friend Dharma. And on this day, when I was trying to get some serious work done, he kept, he kept wanting my notebook. And you can see that I'm, I'm shoving him away, and he keeps bothering me. 
And I think it's the next time he does it, but I really look at him and I say, stop it. And I yell at him and he gets very upset and he puts his trunk in his mouth and he walks away. <laughs> um, he's a sweetheart. He's a semi-wild elephant. You could never do that with a wild elephant. They'd never be so, so friendly but or so comfortable around a human. But he, he knew that I usually had bananas on me. Um, in closing, I would like to share with you, I've sort of put together, imagining if this book was a movie, what it would look like as like a movie trailer. I've just cut together some of the footage that I filmed and then put some of the quotes in there. So if this was going to be a movie, I think this is what it would sort of look like. I'm going to play that and I'm going to run off the stage for a second so we could watch it. We all knew that they would say it was just a legend. Like it was one of the old stories. But this happened in our time. You see out past the villages, there's still magic out there. In the last scraps of jungle, where the old ways still survive. It's the story that the animals asked me to tell. One that would have been lost if it wasn't for the memory of those of us who'd been there to see it for ourselves. They'd say a legend of stripes and fire that came to be known as the girl and the tiger. I should tell you, the, the, that's the American one, and then the book, which I'm so thankful for, is coming out in India, because, which was so important to me that it would be coming out in India where, where the story comes from. Those, that's really the background of, of what, what this book is about. I really wanted to bring in the story of what these animals go through and bring it through a way that people could go on that story and try to make it something that people would be more accessible than just a nonfiction about wildlife. I think that there's so many stories where you know, we're so, we're so, we have so many stories about human interaction and politics and relationships and action and all this stuff. How often do stories deal with what's inside of an animal's mind and what they go through? How many times does a story remember that we're not the only creatures on this planet? And I also think that um, somewhere in my mind was sort of a, sort of, uh, sort of a pushback against uh, what Kipling did with the Jungle Book because I never liked the tiger was the bad guy. And so as an answer to that, um, in this story, the tiger is the refugee trying to survive amidst the people, and the, the, the elephants are, are, that were once rulers of the jungle are chained and trying to figure this out, and we're led through the jungle or on, an, on a journey to the jungle by Isha and her tiger, Kala. So I truly, truly hope you guys enjoy the book, and, I, and I'm not a big famous author yet, but I want to be one day, so please, please, please buy it for your friends and family for the holidays and stuff, uh, share it just uh, try and help me spread this around a little bit because I think it's one of the only things that tries to tell the story of the wildlife, of the tribal people, of the jungle, and uh, I've bled for it. I almost died from an elephant, so make it all worth it for me, but thank you. Thank you.